What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is ready to see hospitality make a comeback. She loves helping create spaces and experiences where people will make lasting memories. She has hospitality design ingrained in her soul. She's a senior interior design manager at Marriott International with a focus on the Moxie brand. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephanie Hopkins. Welcome, Stephanie. Hey, Dan. It's so good to be in person. It's great to be in person. I'm loving this and the, and the experimentation. So thank you for letting me try out something new with you. Yeah, it's been awesome. I mean, I, I think anytime we get a chance to be together finally um, is really good. And, you know, it's exciting to be at HQ and recording. And Oh, yeah, that. that's another thing. We're in the mothership right we now. We're in the mothership. So. We are in the mothership with... Um, yeah, amazing Bethesda behind us. It's pretty cool to be here and exploring around the building. This is yeah. your, what, second time here? Third, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's more than I've been here. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, because you live in Austin. So yeah. I, wanna, I just wanted to let everyone know, like, to kind of loop them into how we came to be right here. Yeah. So about a year and a half ago, we were at a trade show, and I saw Kristen Connery, who was a previous guest. And I said, Kristen, how are you? I'm so happy you... Uh, transitioned over to Marriott. Like, it's kind of exciting, a new journey. I've been doing a podcast. Have you heard it? And she's like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then, and I, but you were standing with her and said, oh, wait, you're Dan Ryan. I love your podcast. And to me, that was like the first real affirmation that like, oh my God, people are actually listening to this and it's kind of oh, cool. So I love that. I'm so uh, I'm a podcast junkie, as I like to call myself. And so, yeah, I was, um, I'm on Kristen's team, kind of. And so we were kind of looking to kind of get some of our, um, be on some podcasts, look and see what's out there in the design industry. So I was like researching and I found yours and was listening to it. And I was like, I love this. So then when I saw you, it was BDNY, I think yes. in maybe 21, I guess, right? Because 20, we didn't do it. And so it was BDNY 21. And um yeah, and that's how this, you know, whole, you know, thing, big friendship got started and how it got started. But yeah, it was really, it was really fun. I just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big podcast fan and love listening to hearing different people's stories and, you know, tell, you know, different little design snippets here and there. It's pretty fun. I love it. Um, it's so, I mean, it's incredible. And, you know, so in, in a way, you're very much a part of the success of this because of that affirmation and then the other conversations we've had at Marriott and I don't know, it's just, thank you. So well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's sweet. I've, I also, also too, like I've heard you kind of start and then develop as a podcast host as you've gone into it. So I have to say that, um, I've been happy to be part of the journey. Kind oh, of, well, so. an important part of the journey. Oh, so well, thank thanks you. Thanks for saying that. It's good to be here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off by, you know, the big question, which is always like, first of all, everyone should know there's so many guests on this, on this show that, um, I call them accidental hospitality people. Yeah. I don't, I, they're not accidental. I don't know what I call them. They're accidental hospitality indus, industry fans or people who kind of happen into this world. And you are one of them. Yeah. One of the many. Yes. And, um, I guess like the big question is from your journey to where you are now, like how do you define hospitality? Yeah, it's, that's good. And obviously I've been thinking about it a lot yeah. <laughs> lately, but I think, um, I mean, you know, I think for me and what really, um, and as being in hospitality, what hospitality kind of means to me is it's more of that kind of, um, it's that overall experience, kind of that 360 degree view. I'm from, Texas and from the South. And, you know, I think thinking back to historically kind of how it was growing up and my mom constantly was entertaining. Like our house was the house where everybody came over and all my friends were there. And, and it was kind of in itself, this hospitality experience, you know, she always kind of had the great food and snacks and the house was always looked a certain way. And she, you know, and it had a certain smell associated with it, you know, the 
lawn was done well when you pulled up. So kind of all of that, I think, has then translated to me into mm -hmm. what hospitality is kind of now. So I think it it is, you know, and what was has been ingrained in me kind of a lot from my early training is it's from the minute you pull into kind of that portico share and what that's ex like coming up to the hotel and how do you guide that experience and then coming in and then the scent that you smell and then how you're greeted and, you know, um, for Moxie, you check in at the bar. So you kind of have that whole experience and then you, um, you have your room, you have the sound, you know, so each hotel has its, its own sound. And then ultimately for me, um, like many hospitality people, I think is really kind of that vibe that you get when you sit down at the bar and you kind of have that, that final drink. So it's just that overall experience of, and then of course the sight of, you know, the beautiful, um, hotel itself. And then just getting that like signature cocktail for kind of that hotel is also a really great experience. So all of that, I think defines a hospitality experience to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from really ultimately kind of thinking back is how it was in my childhood. And then from your childhood to, you know, you go to, you go to school and then you, you were an entrepreneur yeah. in, in a family business with your sister, correct? Yeah. My sister and my sister-in-law, um, started up this window covering company in Austin and they still have it. Um, and they're still going strong and, and doing great. And so I, I graduated with a business degree. And so kind of when we started the company that I had more of like a business lens going into, you know, kind of around operations and financials and things like that. And then we kind of started to expand the product line into, and then I expanded into sales. I mean, as you, anybody who has their own business, you do everything, right? Yeah. You do business development, you do this, you do that. So kind of expanding into sales and then being like one-on-one -on -one with customers and helping them kind of, and then expanding the product line into draperies and things like that. I was like, oh, this is really, this is really cool. Like I think, and I was kind of sketching out draperies and doing stuff that I was completely foreign to me that I'd never done. And so I really started to start to research like interior design and maybe getting a second degree. And that was, you know, this transformation process. Um, and then I found a program in London and went to London to kind of do um, a diploma there. And uh, it was a really awesome experience. And um, and then from there interned at like a, a really great um, British furniture company that mm -hmm. had a bunch of hospitality clients in New York. And then um, got my first gig with Tony Chin Associates. And Unreal. that's a great first and gig. And jumped yeah. into hospitality and kind of just was like, oh, wow, this is pretty awesome. And this is a pretty amazing field to be in, you mm -hmm. know, kind of um, from all of those experiences. And then that's kind of just, that was like my toe in. But I think a lot of times during when I was in London and New York, I was like, I cannot believe this is my life. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is, well, that's what's this so is pretty amazing. You know, there, there's a, um, kind of a hospitality hero of mine who I hope to have on one day, Chip Connolly. He wrote an article a couple of years ago, just kind of putting our lives into quarters, right? I think it, he wrote it because his dad had just turned 80 or something. And he's like, he's just entering the fourth quarter. And if you think about it, like I'm 47, I'm probably just entered the second half. Yeah. And it's crazy to think of life that way. But so many people who have come into this, into the industry, hospitality and, and a lot of the design architect, it, a lot of it's second careers where they're like, they're in the second quarter yeah. and it's like, Hey, there's a new, a new horizon out there that, that excites and engages what we're passionate about. Cause oftentimes I'm not saying you weren't passionate about the, the window treatment company, um, with, with your family, but oftentimes, you know, we have this calling and it's, I'm just always amazed and awestruck by those who are in one channel, but then they're like, you know what? Something's calling me in a different way. It's like, um, kind of like that field of dreams yeah. kind of feeling. If you build it, they will come. And I'm just, I think it's so cool that you went on that journey and, and to Europe and the experience you had and then to New York at Tony Chi. I also think what's in, really interesting with your journey in particular, as it relates to going from, I think you were at Bridgeton, yeah. which is like a small, it's a, they have a, a bunch of hotels, but it's mostly independent boutique yes. hotels, correct? Yeah. So like an independent developer. Yes. And really great properties. Um, I'm Thank a fan you. of many of them. Um, but 
to go from that kind of smaller independent over to here to Marriott, which is like, you know, 30 something brands, it's, it's enormous, but then finding your place in here with Moxie that kind of, in a way bridges the gap between the really big, like big box hotel brand to the smaller one and kind of creating these really intimate experiences in really great locations. Yeah. I think, you know, working and when I was working at Bridgeton, I think that was, um, a really amazing, like a really great experience and a lot of good learnings, like learning about, you know, kind of from the independent perspective. And, and I think the lens that I didn't have then was how it was done systematically kind of with the brands, you know, coming from an interior design firm and interior design background, you don't necessarily know the inner workings of kind of everything brand related. Um, and especially, you know, in working at Tony Chi, working on luxury products, it's a little bit different than kind of working on some of the, like the Moxies and, and the more select serve brands. So Virgin was just, uh, it was a great experience. I love, I love the people there. Um, they're doing really great things. And it was, I designed my first hotel by myself there. Oh, which and one was that? It's in East Hampton oh, and it's Journey East Hampton. Journey East Hampton. Because there's another one over there called Maram. There is another one, Maram. And Maram. that one we ended up kind of, I was on that project too, more project managing it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really interesting about just, you know, we kind of had, um, and I think Atit, who owns the company, has these really big dreams and it's really fun to be a part of and, and try to help achieve what those are and be, and kind of be on that roller coaster of that. So that, I, I had a lot of, um, you know, these really great moments and wins that kind of I, I can see now in the project and running. And then there's a whole operational team that really makes it work as well. Um, but when I did Journey in Hampton, that one, um, it was just a really, I remember like the first time I was there, I stayed the night and everything that I'd seen in my head was kind of there in person. And I, I don't think I'll ever forget that experience or what that's like, or how to even really put that into words. I was just like, I, thought of all of this in my head and this exists now and the space that people come to. And I think I was saying this to you, like people will, you know, they will get engaged and stay there or they'll bring their kids for the first time or their parents will, or all of these like really, really awesome, you know, experiences that people have in their lives are all kind of based around hotels a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I was just like, oh man, I love this. <laughs> and I think that's, and so Bridget and I learned a lot there. And I think the carrot that brought me to Marriott for me was really the Moxie brand. I think that independence of the Moxie brand, I really love the Moxie, even ownership groups that we work with. They have a lot of independent nature to them. So I, I really relate to them. I relate to them from an entrepreneurial background, from kind of having the independence, you know, working with for an independent developer and then you know, now being on the brand side and it's been really interesting to just see where all of it comes from and, and kind of the, the system, the system of the brand, right. And like the, and, and how things work and why they work that way. That was a really important part of my, I think, hospitality education yeah. that I, that I was kind of missing that I really wanted to know. And Moxie, um, brought me over, you know, kind of, and I was like, Oh, wow, they're really flipping the script. They're checking in at the bar. They're really changing that whole experience, you know? And at the time, there weren't that many hotels open in the U.S. and Canada. And um, so it's been a really fun to be on the, on the brand and kind of seeing it grow. And How many are there? There's 25 now? So there's 27 open in the U.S. and Canada right now. There's 120 open internationally. Mm -hmm. And then this year, and you know, but slated to open this year in U.S. and Canada, we have 13. So Jeez. half of that. And I think that's, it's going to be a really exciting year. I mean, obviously things drug out because of, you know, 2020 mm -hmm. and it drug out kind of some timelines and stuff. Um, so we'll see, but I'm really excited about it. I think I, you know, we were talking about that and I was looking back through the pipeline and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's some really exciting ones opening um, that it'll be fun to, you know, have been a part of and kind of really, um, it's just been an interesting because it's still in kind of the select serve. It's not really what you would call full service. Yeah. Um, and learning what that's about and learning like those traits of myself that are more, you know, like I, I want to go downstairs and pour my own coffee and hit the road and go and yeah. things like that. And I really relate to kind of a lot of that type of guests that we cater to. 
so a few minutes ago, you, I love what you said. Also, just having interviewed someone who was a playwright that became a hospitality industry professional, oh, right? that's awesome. And you used the word flipping the script, right? So I'm curious, you know, on your journey from Texas to England to New York, working at Tony Chi, then to Bridgeton, and then you're probably doing some projects, and then you get that journey hotel, yeah. right? Your first one, it's kind of like, here you go. How did that script flipping like impact you when you were like, well, you got a clean slate and you could go do it. How did you feel at that moment? Like, were you overwhelmed, excited, all of the above? And like, what was like the first big step you took towards bringing that project to completion? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a lot of it was, um, you know, the Bridgeton team was really lean, especially like kind of around design, but in, in general at the time, it was, it was just, it's just a lean team in, in general. So there was a lot of other things going on, I think. And I think if I just had to focus on that one project, I probably would have been overwhelmed, but I was more like, okay. Um, and I think too, I think working for the independent and, and then know, and being more involved with the developer and knowing where the capital comes from and kind of the money behind it, it felt like a personal, like I was, um, you know, working with them personally. Like I just knew kind of all of the players and it had a more of an impact about it for me. So there was a pressure to it, but I think also um, there was so much going on that it was kind of just, um, you know, kind of reacting to like each step of doing it. And, you know, I, I, I think I for sure had those moments of like, can I do this? Am I going to pull this off? Are there a hundred thousand things I would have done differently? Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, totally. I think there always is. Right. Um, but I think overall, like, um, and, and, you know, we kind of were doing it as a, like a design build and learning that process and being on site more and kind of working with, you know, a, you know, a different type of contractor than a kind of a big box contractor that uh, maybe doesn't read the drawings all the time that you have to sketch stuff on the napkin for and stuff. So it was really, um, I learned a lot. I learned how to think on my feet, I think mostly and mm -hmm. to problem solve and to realize that nothing is kind of precious and perfect. I mean, I think if I didn't learn that as an entrepreneur, which happened all the time, you know, I think that really was just like how to think on my feet, how to think and solve that problem. Because if we delayed like one more day, that was one more day of delaying opening, one more day of heads and beds, one more day of return on investment. You know, you kind of have that more of that lens, I think, is working on the developer side of it. Mm. Um, it's also, you know, hearing you say, would you do a thousand things differently? Yes. And it's, I just have to kind of breathe and relax and get to the point where it's not going to be perfect. Right. Yeah. But it, you know, it's good. And that's really interesting because, you know, having come from Tony Chi's office where, you know, the detail that oh, they yes. do, and I would call that like, just everything has to be so perfect and detailed out and fitting and like. The detail that they have on projects is amazing. And then to go from that to, okay, we're going to just figure it out. Like, how did you reconcile that? Or did that, did that serve you on that journey to, at the journey? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I think back to like sitting in some meetings with Tony and I think a lot of stuff um, that I think I took forward with me everywhere was around that foundation of the design. And at the time I would have a lot of me, Tony, but like my senior associate was Johnny Marsh. And I think a lot of just like, mm -hmm. I remember just talking through kind of some of these meetings and just, um, you know, really about, I think so much guiding that guest experience and how every detail does matter to a level, right? Every de or every detail does matter when you're in that experience in a very detailed. Um, so I think as working with, with the developer, working with Bridgeton, sorry, and then um, moving forward, I had to learn what to let go of a little bit. Oh. And I think that I don't think, and I think what I appreciate and, you know, celebrate Tony uh, for is that he doesn't let go of anything. Like he, everything is the most important but when I was in that other situation and we had this deadline that we had to get to and I it couldn't I couldn't hold up the process and couldn't be perfect because we had all of these you know the pressure of the financial side of it that you really feel from that perspective of not just being in an interior design firm world um 
I was like, okay, we're going to have to give on this or I'm going to have to give on that. And, sh you know, should I have and, and kind of making those compromises and trying to make the best decision that I could in that amount of time frame for all of them. So I had to learn that a lot pretty quick on my beat. You know, I think it's really interesting because when I think of those of so many of the Tony Chi projects that I've seen, it's like it, the vision is it has to be uncompromising, mm -hmm. right? When you look, when you go into those places and you're just like, wow, like this is amazing. And then to learn how to compromise and get it done because you have all these other pressures, still maintaining your vision, but maybe, I think, what did you say? You said, let go. You had to learn how to let go mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you're, you're still driving, you're driving the bus, but then you think about, I think you were, earlier, you were talking about really learning that brand systems to come here where, if you look at the value that all the big brands have created, it's in that brand, yes. right? And in a way you have to be uncompromising about that with focus groups and what is the customer want and who is the customer. So like how did, like if you were to talk about your journey from, you know, being uncompromising to letting go a little bit to coming back or coming to Marriott and really being a champion for the Moxie brand, and working in this brand environment at this, like, I don't, it's like 36 different brands. Like, yeah. how do you reconcile all that? Or where, like, where did you want, where do you think you wind up on that spectrum now of uncompromising to letting go a little bit to now, like so much is riding on all these brands that Marriott has and is creating. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a good, that's a good question because I still feel like I compromise a lot, but I think more so, um, yeah, I think I'm more, you know, I consider myself kind of like a brand steward now a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So I have that brand, but I work on other brands too, but we'll just use Moxie as a good example because I work on a lot of the Moxie projects. Um, and so just really trying to make sure that that Moxie brand and that Moxie brand DNA really comes through in those projects, right? Uh, because that is a really specific, because we have so many brands, not every brand is for every person, right? So you really want to make sure you're kind of in that brand genre, right? And you're delivering kind of on that brand product to, to get, to keep in kind of, and so we don't, you know, muddy the waters and mm. we always call them, a lot of people say swim lane. So we don't get over into somebody else's swim lane and we kind of keep in that, in that one, because otherwise I think all the product would be the same and all the brands would kind of be the same. Totally. Um, so I feel like I had to get that strong. And I mean, I think probably in, in the beginning too, really just really understanding where that Moxie brand DNA was really understanding how, what this job and this role was for me and mm -hmm. how I was going to step into it and do it Stephanie's way and versus, you know, kind of every other way. And that's really where I've seen it. So I still find it, I still am compromising and working with ownership groups all the time on how they can get their needs and wants in this way of doing it. Kind of, so that like skill set is still really there. It's still what I do all the time. Um, but you know, it's just really making sure they kind of do it in that same way. So that DNA comes through on all the Moxie projects. Yeah. And it's, it's also, and I guess in a way you can say compromising, but it's also trying to find, you know, there's so many stakeholders in a project from brand to owner to, mm -hmm. um, to, to the, the city, firms. to the to design, the design firm. firms, right? Yeah, but to the local, to the municipality where it's going, to the people who are working there. And it's, it's instead of compromising, maybe it's trying to find the path where you have as many wins as possible. Everyone is winning as much as possible. Yeah, I think that's a great way of saying it. And I think it's, um, and it's just, you know, negotiating, it's just a dance kind of, of like, and every project is really different and every, you know, ownership group has a unique set of wants and needs that they're kind of bringing to the table. And it's, you know, understanding what those are, kind of getting that out front and then, you know, working also with the design firms that also have those same desires, wants and needs. They all have, the, we all have the same things that we're bringing to the table. So yeah, it's how many wins can you get across the board kind of for everybody and really aligning as a partnership to move forward to getting that project open. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, I look at myself so much more as a partner now um, than, you know, even I kind of, you know, as I've kind of evolved through. And mm -hmm. I think that's where, like, where I think of it as I'm a good resource and partner of how to get this project from even to feasibility, you know, to where it passes off and gets open to the openings team. Hmm. 
And then as you were talking, I was thinking about my conversation with Os Oswaldo. Mm -hmm. um, and he was sharing, and Oswaldo, for those of you who didn't hear that one, it's uh, he's the, the champion for the edition brand yeah. for Marriott. Um, but what I was struck by when I was speaking with him was how the edition, that collaboration, was seen as so important by Arnie Sorensen. Like he, he was like, no, this has to happen because I think somehow, if I remember correctly, he saw the power of these independent brands, right? Yeah. And, and how it could really take Marriott forward. And if you look at all the other brands, the Hilton, Hilton and Accor, like they're also championing a lot of these little life, like li not little, but like lifestyle branded hotels. Is there a way to tie the genesis of Moxie, which was probably before you joined, yep. or it was before you joined, to like, what role did that addition and seeing the importance of these independent lifestyle hotels, or boutique hotels, um, how did that have an influence on the, like the birth of Moxie? Mm. You know, I know a lot more about the story for Moxie and how it came to the U.S. and kind of, but it was started in Europe. And I think a lot of the product that you see like in Europe was kind of had a little bit of a different direction. And then, you know, we had a really great developer in in New York that saw it and really wanted to, to make it, you know, um, make a deal kind of and bring Moxie to the U.S. And that's where we got the Moxies that were opening in New York with Lightstone. And, um, you know, we have Times Square. They just opened one in Bowery. They're opening one in Williamsburg. Um, Chelsea, East Village. Chelsea, East Village. They're, they opened Miami South Beach. So that kind of is, you know, bringing it over. I think, I think Moxie satisfied kind of this, you know, in, in Europe, it was kind of more like a hostel. It definitely, and it definitely has the hostel -y vibe. It's basically, you know, a lot of times we talk about it as being a bar with rooms on top. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the kind of vibe that it is. It's a very, so it satisfied this really unique customer base, I think, and mm. this really unique concept to bring into Marriott, right? It's, it's not, um, you know, it's not something that you, every Bonvoy guest or every Bonvoy Platinum guest is going to be happy with a moxie there's no you know there's there's pegs on the wall it's flexible ff and e inside there so you you just hang your your you know coat you hang this on all the pegs you don't necessarily have a closet that you put it into you know it's and it's a really kind of i like to say rough and tumble kind of brand like you know it has a lot of grittiness to it it's it's really for somebody who's like hey i'm gonna go i'm gonna be there for a couple of days and it's that kind of person that's going to go upstairs and throw their bag upstairs and come down and work on their laptop at the bar, you know, and have a cocktail where they're finishing their emails of the day or, and then go out and meet friends for dinner. It's just, you know, and so I think it really similarly to how the addition I think was really unique and captured that really unique and almost made, I feel like luxury approachable to, yeah. I think Moxie kind of came into this like generation and brought this new brand to, to marry it that is kind of more of an independent, you know, lifestyle brand that kind of appeals to a backpacker or somebody coming and, you know, it's, it's elevated, it's, um, you know, evolved and kind of the guest is a little bit, I think a little bit more sophisticated than what originally we thought. It's now kind of like we're thinking about business travelers and it being, you know, really good for a lot of people. I've stayed in a lot of moxies and I think my favorite time was this like, couple they were probably maybe mid 60s and i was like oh my gosh do you guys um how do you feel how do you like staying here and they're like we love moxie we love it we just love how it's always in this urban heartbeat of downtown we love the accessibility of everything that we want to do we're never in our room so we don't need the room to be you know because the rooms are 185 square feet they're tiny rooms and so it was just really refreshing to kind of see and think about what that guest really is compared mm -hmm. to thinking, oh, it's just going to be this young traveler that, you know, is coming with like a small bag or something like that. So I really think it captures this unique guest for Marriott. That's interesting because I would always think of the guest or potential guest or customer of a hotel as a, as a demographic, right? Right. 
but by hearing about and you're talking about young backpackers but then the 60 year old couple yeah who it's really a it's like it's a mindset it's more a than a, yeah it's, yeah, it's a psychographic for sure and we say like i think part of like all of the branding around it and the and what we say when we're it's really if you're kind of young at heart you know that's really where that person is and i think um it's a lot of what a lot of us want you know it's you know definitely when you're you're traveling and you're on the go and you want to be in the heart of the city there's that's moxie's a great brand for that you know um if you're you know traveling with with kids maybe not so much you know there's not a lot of space in there for the little one there's not a lot of space for extra stuff so I that's think. when you have to go out into the park and push <laughs> yeah, them out there exactly and exactly <laughs> um so i know like we're, we're talking about these journeys um your journey from entrepreneur to studying design to ultimately designing the journey hotel your um, journey to marriott yeah. um i love i love the journey word um so as you look back on your life experience and, and up to where you are now and you think about the journey forward what's exciting you most about what you what you're seeing out there ahead of you oh my gosh that's a great question um i think a little bit you know um I think personally, I think everybody is almost like this new person's developed for a lot of people kind of through the pandemic and stuff. And I had a baby during that time frame, So it's like a whole new awakening almost of me as kind of this person. And, and I get really excited about kind of what I don't know, learning more things, you know, kind of new frontiers. I'm really excited about like female entrepreneurs lately and meeting with them. Um, you know, there's this really cool concept in D.C. Um, by this woman named Kelsey Lentz, and she did this Two Birds, um, which is this co-working childcare space. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's like she, she did a presentation for us. Um, and so basically it's like a Reggio Emilio. The, it's in, and so the kids, that's a, that's a form of like education. Yeah, ed education for kids. And but then there's like this need and this co-working need of parents. And I think about you and me and people who we were talking the other day and you were like, I need to get this extra space for me so I can be away from where the kids are at or whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I need in my life right yeah. now. Um, there's not one in Austin. So, but there, there's two, I think there's two in DC and I think there's, she's opening one more. Oh, wow. Um, so I guess I think like, I think that's really exciting about new concepts like that, that there's still new concepts that we haven't all thought of that we haven't all seen, you know, and new, um, you know, new projects open, new design firms to come in, new ideas coming out there. So I think the unknown of like what's ahead and where to go is really exciting to me. And I, um, I think we talked about like, I think that's the one thing that I'm really passionate about is just, you know, I work with a lot of different developers and there are not a ton of women in development. And I think really getting excited about how to become more involved in that and how to help you know, get more women involved and more women kind of owning hotels and being in it. There are definitely some out there, but there are not as many as I would like to see. So I think that's I totally a really agree. passionate you, part. When I go to some of these more on the, in the ownership investment side conferences and you look, go into this room and it's, it's mostly all men in suits. And then usually there's a couple of women in suits and they tend to be working for the law firms, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but I am seeing more women entrepreneurs do this and to hear about this Kelsey Lynn's person and her co-working childcare, that is amazing. It's such a great concept that I'm like, yeah, why hasn't anybody thought of this before? Or why, maybe there are people doing it, but I, I just was, it was, it kind of really blew me away. And just thinking about what in my current stage of life, like that, ticks all the boxes of what I kind of need, mm -hmm. right? You know? Um, What's interesting is here in Merritt HQ, the spaces up here are very flexible. So it's kind of like a co-working space yes. in a way with lots of collaboration points. And then there's childcare child on, the the on the second on the second or third floor, yep. which is amazing. Yes, that's amazing. And I think this was kind of, I think thinking about it through the pandemic mm -hmm. and like when we weren't all in office and this was, our building wasn't even open then, right? Mm. They were still, it was still under construction. It does, it wasn't even open, but I think just, you know, being remote and working remote and kind of, you know, where that is. And 
it just, I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds dreamy. Like I'm so excited. So I just, I think there's a lot of, I feel like new horizons mm -hmm. coming up. I just feel like there's a little bit of, you know, I still think everybody's still dealing obviously with effects of the pandemic still, you know, dealing with, you know, COVID and COVID restrictions within, you know, um, and all of the implications around that, the supply chain delays. And every, that's still such a reality of everything that we deal with on a daily basis. But I just feel like there's this whole new, I don't know, new horizon coming that we can't really see what it is. You mm -hmm. know, I think everybody reacted instantly after the pandemic and became one way. And now I think it's going to correct to maybe the way that it's going to be moving forward. Yeah, almost like down a different path. Yeah, like it's it like, oh, wait, we did do that. And I think it being okay that we did it one way mm -hmm. right after the pandemic, but it wasn't necessarily where we should be. Let's self-correct and get to this path. So I just feel like that happening kind of a lot in a lot of different conversations I'm having lately. So for me, just to get back to the point, I think it's just the unknown of what's ahead, I think is really exciting for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the quarter life chapters. I always think of like, okay, well, this is like, um, you know, you know, how many more careers and jobs am I going to have? Like I, you know, I did the entrepreneur, I'm in the hospitality design, I, you know, mom, I've added that onto my resume, you know? And so what are the new things that are coming forward? I for love me? that you just said, mom, I added that to my resume. hundred percent. Cause it is more than a job. Oh my gosh. It's, it's a journey. It's a journey. It's, <laughs> it is, I've said this the other day, it is my most favorite role I have had in my life thus far. Great. Yeah, I'm loving it. So it's um it's 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 really fun and great. So um so as far as you know, we talked about what's exciting you and about the future, which I find like it's this new path that's opened up and we kind of it, it's a little unknown, it's exciting and also it could be a little unnerving, right? Yeah. So if you think about what's keeping you up at night on the unnerving side, what what's that? Oh, I guess I think more so of um, what does that all mean? I guess kind of, you know, I think I think also like oh, we're talking so much about sustainability and with kind of all of the news, um, you know, sustainability coming up. And I think thinking about the big picture of it all kind of sometimes gets a little bit overwhelming. Like, how are we all going to make this impact? How are we going to, how's this going to affect all of us in the future? What is it going to be like, you know, for our kids down the road? Like we're having all of these, you know, seemingly crazy weather events even happening now. And, you know, and, and what does all of that look like for the future? So that part I think kind of is a little bit like, it feels really big yeah. and really insurmountable. And, but I think thinking about the little pieces of what I can do personally, professionally, um, you know, what those little things I can be a part of help me kind of get through that, you know? And, but I think the unknown of like, I think it excites me, but I'm also like, I wish I knew what was going to happen next for me, kind of, you know, or, yeah. or in this or that, but you never know. So it, res it resonates with me when you say it's like, it's like really big, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of this nebulous cloud. And then whenever I, whenever I think of that, I think about someone, I don't know where I read this or heard this, but it's someone said, you know, you know, the best way to eat an, an elephant is one bite at a time. Yeah. Right. So I feel like personally and professionally, we can all do things to take that bite. Um, because I don't know that whole, the bigness of, of those issues, it's, they're so massive. They are massive. And I just feel good knowing that I, myself take little bites and the companies I work with take little bites and which I think, and I hope, and I actually, I truly believe will turn into bigger change in the future. And you guys have been a big champion of, uh, sustainability for, I think maybe one of the first big brands to bring that under. It's, yeah. And I mean, I think at this point in time, it's, it's such a topic of every single conversation that we're having and how we're going to get to the zero emissions and mm -hmm. how we're going to start planning towards that. I don't think necessarily in, in the beginnings of that. And I think seeing that evolve and how that's going to implement and affect, um, 
overall is going to be really exciting to mm. see. It's just, and there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of people working on it. Um, and I just am taking like kind of what I can, like my, you know, small portion of what I can do just for me and my projects I work on. And mm. can we, can this one project make a couple more sustainable choices until we get to kind of what those regulations are, not regulations, but what would we kind of want to like implement across the board. Yeah. So, um, and you know, that's also how I do it. Like personally is what can I kind of do personally around to, to be more sustainable. And I think a, another big step is you can't change anything until you start measuring it. Yes. And I feel like I was at a, a meeting down here between MindClick and, yes. and Marriott and the, the measuring is happening. And you know what? Sometimes we might not like what we're seeing, but once we know what a baseline is, we can improve from there. And I, I don't know. It's we got to we got to we we can't bury our heads in the sand. We got to look, measure, see what impacts are across everything, and then we can all make changes. And I think having those goals front and center. And I'm so excited to hear that they're happening in every conversation. Because I remember in like 2008, they were happening in every conversation. And they kind of went away and yeah. now it's making a bit and maybe that's one of the things that have come out of the pandemic like yeah. you said right maybe that's that alternate that that different path like how can we think about things differently yeah seeing how good it was for the whole globe and climate to not have everybody outside yeah <laughs> to have everybody inside and um what that kind of did for us all personally too like that whole rebirthing kind of for everything yeah i it's I think, you know, we're working, um, like I work we're working with, you know, MindClick on a project kind of and, and how to get it to be more sustainable. And it's, you know, Joanna and her team are really amazing. I think I applaud them for going down this road. It's really important. It's a big job, but it's a lot of information. Yeah. There's a lot of information out there. And I think they help start to make it digestible and help designers, you know, see this approach of like how we can start to make you know, it's the one designer at the one firm that chooses that one more sustainable product totally. or, you know, from whatever. And they look at the product from, you know, a multitude of varying degrees of how it can be more sustainable. So, yeah. like I said, I think it's all those little steps. So if the one designer at the one firm can do that and then the one project at Marriott can do that and then the one project here and so forth. I think those are some big, um, you know, getting to the steps until we kind of have, okay, all Marriott projects will meet this particular guideline and all projects, we'll start to see that around all brands, right? Yeah. And they're uh, getting there. There's there's sustainability committees and, you know, there's sustainability conference. So there were, it's coming. It's know? very exciting. Yeah. Um, zooming back into where we're sitting right now and in the new Marriott headquarters, it's such a cool building and there's so many amazing features. What's your, what, do you have a favorite feature of, what what's going on in here yeah um i was like i love the la colombe coffee because it's my favorite oh the, it is good <laughs> it is always been my favorite i it was, it's one of the things i miss a ton from when i was in new york was going to get la colombe coffee with all shout out to all my tony chi colleagues so we'd go for an afternoon coffee <laughs> um so yeah so i love that i love i think just the building in general is if you had been to the Fernwood building, um, it was just very different. And yes. I, it was really coming from New York and moving to DC and like going into the Fernwood building. It didn't really capture kind of the energy and vibe that I get from a lot of the people. I'm always like amazed and surprised with a new Marriott person that I meet of like, this is a powerhouse team. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't, of course, not everybody always, but like there's so many smart, intelligent this varying degrees of people here. And I think this building represents that now, right? You get kind of that really cool design feature of it. I think overall, my favorite part of it is just being able to connect with the colleagues again. So I don't think I have like one specific spot that I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, this is my most favorite spot. I haven't found that yet, but it's just so refreshing to be around all the faces again and to be in person and to kind of just take a minute, say hi, so nice to see you in 3D versus 2D. Oh, yeah. 4D. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, totally. So, it's just, you know, I think all of those things of just um, being here in person and mm -hmm. seeing that. that. That's probably my favorite part of it. 
But I think the entrance when you walk in is pretty and the double height space is pretty show stopping. Yeah. It seems more in alignment with what Marriott is all about than the Fernwood building, right? That was just like an office building. Yeah. Right. But then but you did some cool you you know, you you blew out some things and, and made it work for you guys, but I feel like this is this is where it's always wanted to be. Yeah, right? and I think having the and also, you know, even, you know, um the suites that were there next to the Fernwood building. I mean, this Marriott hotel next door is wow, it just blows it out of the water. And then I you know, then there's an AC up the street. Um it's kind of, kind of associated with HQ as well. That's also, you know, there it's just I think really everybody kind of brought their A game. So it's awesome to be here and kind of you feel that energy and vibe, I think, about being here. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Marriott HQ also because we did all the furniture there with Burma <laughs> Fox. So that was that was it's a it's a it's a real trophy property for us to yeah. be right across the street. Yeah, so I think that's you know, and that's a good it's it's part of the new horizons for and I'm really Marriott excited too. for all the model rooms to open up over there. Yes. I was just talking to Bob over there and it sounds like it's all happening and I, I can't wait to be able to walk through them. Yeah, so the, yeah, so for those people who don't know, Marriott in the hotel next door is building a model room, not for every brand, but for most brands. We have we're gonna have a model room that represents each brand. So that's really exciting. Um, yeah. so especially for a lot of developers, they they have an idea of what they want, but it's it it's so hard for people who are not you and people like you to really visualize what the three D space is like yeah. how it feels what, yeah. like the touch the feel the whole experience so it's i think it'll be an amazing tool just like it was in the last place down in the basement but you know you're in the basement there with backlit kind of photos of of landscape yeah. now, now you get and moxie the was in light. a trailer i don't know if you did you ever oh, yeah. <laughs> moxie was in a trailer in the parking lot oh i didn't know that yeah it was pretty funny was which, it an airstream at least no, no it was like a container which kind of fits okay. the brand right okay. so it's moxie's gritty and has this gritty <laughs> dna to it but um yeah it's exciting and it's i think gonna be um you know i think what has been fun for me is i've done a lot more like um hotel tours mm -hmm. kind of with developers and stuff too like you know they they want to do a moxie project i'm like let's go here because what's a better experience than going and acting like you know like you're going to check in on a moxie and check in at the bar and have a moxie cocktail and kind of get the whole vibe of the space so mm -hmm. i think that's been really fun to do and it'll be better now that like more are going to open there's going to be more it's going to be easier to meet somebody somewhere and you know go tour the hotel so that's really fun totally um well i'm excited for you um I know I asked you about your favorite feature here and being from Austin. I'm always curious, where's the best queso in Austin? Oh, that's a good question. It's a very dangerous food because I can't stop eating it when I encounter it. Mm, I mean, Matt's El Rancho is probably one of my, it's like a- Matt's El Rancho. It's like a classic spot. Okay. And they have this like Bob, they have the, the queso- You get to roll up the, your tortillas and dip them in there? Yeah, they have the queso with like the ground beef oh. and the, you know, the guacamole all kind of combined into one big thing. I can um, feel myself getting fatter just oh, hearing that. Oh my gosh. When I used to come <laughs> back to Austin when I didn't live there and I would come back, definitely had to bring a second <laughs> pair of pants because I would not fit into the same because yeah. I would eat- because, I mean, there's, it's not light food. There's, it's great Tex-Mex. I mean, now there's so many other restaurants, but also the barbecue is, you know, mm -hmm. on point. And it's just, it's, there's a lot of different hotels opening there, um, you know, kind of unique and, you know, boutique-y. It's, it's an exciting place to be. Well, speaking of women entrepreneurs, too, Bunkhouse is really awesome because their whole leadership team, I think it might be the only leadership team of a hotel brand that is all women. And yeah. that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I mean, and then, you know, um, Liz Lampert, who started Bunkhouse, who she's kind of started a, a new thing herself, too. And it's yeah. uh, McGuire Lampert Hospitality. And um, yeah. She's amazing. She's, she's amazing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Definite um, fan girl of, of Liz's and all the, the great things that she's brought to hospitality. She was just so far ahead of her time, kind of, of like, you know, thinking about El Cosmico and kind of... Um, you know, kind of that urban camping mm -hmm. and glamping. And then it's like a huge thing. And she did that years ago, you know. Um, how, how old were you when you um, started working at the drapery fabrication company? 
with your sister? We were, I was young. I was 20, maybe 23, 24. 23, 24. Okay. So I love asking this question of everyone, but like the, the Stephanie I'm talking to now, let's just say you magically appear in front of your 24 year old self. Oh yeah. What advice do you have for yourself? Yeah. Not that different than probably what I would say to myself now. <laughs> um, I think, I think take a deep breath. It's all going to work out kind of how it should. And in the way it should, it's very hard to know that in general in life, I think. And, but when I was young, I was really feeling, uh, ungrounded kind of, you know, untethered, mm -hmm. I guess, and not really sure if this was the right move or this is this in kind of, um, and I think really, you know, I learned so much kind of being an entrepreneur and, and working there and, and, and everything that we did. I mean, a really a lot of it in the, and the business development stuff, but I think really taking the risk, I'd always had this in my head that I wanted to do this one thing. I wanted to go to school abroad. I wanted to go to college in a different state. I wanted to do these things, but I was always slightly timid and scared to do it, I think, mm -hmm. and not sure of myself. And I think that really gave me the confidence and that decision to go back to school whenever most of my friends were just starting to really hit their stride in their careers. And really, I was like, oh, I'm going to reinvent myself and go back to school and I'm going to go to London and do it in a completely different place where I know nobody and... um that decision changed my life. So I would say bet on yourself. It's a good bet and take those risks because even if you fall on your face a ton, which literally happened and <laughs> figuratively happened a lot through there. Right. I mean, I won't say, um, you know, but like take the risk, like go to that school that's out of state or go to that, that abroad program or take that trip to Japan or, um, you know, all the things that maybe people are a little bit scared of doing because of the unknown of it. Just, I would say, just take the leap. Take the leap. Mm -hmm. I like, take the leap. I like bet on yourself. That's a good one. Yeah. I just, I think I definitely didn't have the same confidence level that I, you know, you get more and more confident as mm -hmm. you kind of grow up and do more things, but as you get into the second and third quarters. Yeah. The, and you do, <laughs> but I just, I, I often you know, especially like getting into your routine and getting bogged down into what that routine is. I really try to think about that, about remember what made you make the decision and move. Remember that feeling and what that is and all of those amazing things that happened afterwards kind mm -hmm. of, that would have been really different if I wouldn't have done that. And um, I just, yeah, bet on yourself. And yeah, it's a big move. Yeah, it was a big move. I still, I don't, I could, today I was like, I would, I, I don't think I would, but I just, I, I try to remember that. I say that all the time to my husband when we're talking about stuff because he's done some similar things and I just am like, remember why we did these things. Like, let's remember, we're these people. Let's keep being these people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. We got to get back to who we are. Yeah. And we're, I think it gets, you know, especially as we're working further in our careers and you get, I think it sometimes gets hard to be true to yourself, especially when you're representing, you know, bigger brands and how to do it, how to bring a uniqueness to whatever your role and job is. So, um, I really try to remember that when I, and, you know, try to be just the Stephanie partner mm -hmm. <laughs> on the project and, and really bring all my assets of what I have to it. And, you know, well, I'm grateful for all of your assets because, you know, like I said in the beginning, you're a real part of the success of this. And, you know, I just want to say thank you. And if, if, if people wanted to learn more about what you're up to with Moxie or get in touch with you, like what's a good way for them to do that? Yeah, they can email me um, for sure at Marriott, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, all of the above. I'm, you know, pretty available. Awesome. Um, but I, I really want to give you a heartfelt thank you because I'm so glad we're here. Uh, I'm so glad that you were like my first fan. Oh, and did you, I mean, are we going to tell everybody that this is like 
my dream to be on a podcast. You, yes. <laughs> well, I feel like it's like this. I was like, I have wanted to be. I and this is just like the whole full circle for me to be mm. on and to be a guest. So thank you for wanting me to be a guest. Oh, I'm my, so excited to be here. It's the very least I could do. And well, now your dream, you can check the dream box. So, I mean, now so, there has to be other dreams. Yeah. Right? So now you got what you got to think of. What's your next dreams? Where, where <laughs> you know, it's like wherever we are now, or wherever we want to get to, we get there, and then what? Right. Yeah. I, I feel like you're never. You're never done dreaming. You're never done with your goals. I think the new horizons and what's out there. Yeah. I think there's this bunch of new stuff that's going to come that we don't even know yet. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I also want to thank all of you people out there, the listeners. Um, without you, I wouldn't be here right now either. So we keep growing. And if this has changed your mind on a journey into hospitality or how hospitality is delivered to others, uh, please pass it on. It's all word of mouth. And thank you.